Barkley, and I am program director with the Oak Ridges Marine Land Trust. Um, all, and then I have Serena here, she's our outreach coordinator, and then Sue Walmer, who is our CEO. Um, our stars of the evening, I will introduce in a little bit, uh, Joseph, Andres, and June. Uh, I'm just going to give you, take this opportunity to give you a little um, intro into the Oak Ridges Marine Land Trust and what we do, because I find a lot of people aren't really aware what land trusts do, and I think it's pretty cool what we do, which is why I work here. Um, I'd like to start this webinar with a land acknowledgement. Um, and I'm asking the um, people listening to just when you hear land acknowledgement to really think about the words and um, appreciate what the intent of it is and um, and why they're being used. We acknowledge that Indigenous people have had and continue to have presence and deep connection with the lands on and near the Oak Ridges Moraine, a part of what is known to the Indigenous people of North America as Turtle Island. These lands are the territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Chippewas of Georgina Island, Rama, Beausoleil, and of the Mississaugas of Alderville, Curve Lake, Hiawatha, and Scugog Island, the First Nations of the Williams Treaties. We would like to thank them and other Indigenous peoples for sharing this land with us. Indigenous people have been subjected to colonial oppression and injustice, and that continues to this day. The Oak Ridges Marine Land Trust acknowledges that the first step to reconciliation is recognizing Indigenous people and their inherent rights to the land, which will ensure that we are creating a better future by strengthening our relationship with them and the land. Our land trust endeavors to honor the land and its treaties by ensuring healthy ecosystems that thrive forever. We recognize that working together with Indigenous peoples to include ecological traditional knowledge systems moves us towards an equitable and sustainable future. And I'd just like to take this moment to think, um, or to make a call to action to everybody. Um, if there's any uh, non-Indigenous people in the crowd, which I know there are, um, to support local businesses, Indigenous businesses, to help share the wonderful knowledge, and to speak up against injustices. As I, as I said in the land acknowledgement, sadly, they're still happening today. So speak up. Um, support the local Indigenous communities and businesses, and why we're here today is to help share that knowledge because it's it's pretty um, amazing stuff. So thank you. Um, so a little bit about the Land Trust. We are a registered charity. We are located in Ontario, Canada, just north of Toronto for everyone um, who's coming from outside of the immediate area and might not know what the Oak Ridges Moraine is or where we are. Uh, we do ecological protection and then we do permanent protection. So uh, anyone who is in Ontario probably has seen some of the changes. Uh, we are protection beyond legislation. And we do that through um, either land ownership, we receive land donations, or we have uh, land easement or conservation easement donations. And those are ones that stay with the deed of the land, but the um, ownership stays with the private owner. And what this allows us to do is to protect nature forever. And that's a pretty awesome thing. Um, I would say one of my favorite parts of the job is, well, I get to go out and, and spend time in these amazing nature areas, but to sit in a forest and know that one day it's going to be old growth without worrying about becoming a subdivision or a parking lot. It's, it's a pretty great thing that that, that is. Uh, it's mandated protection. It's probably, I think it's the best protection um, that you can get for protecting conservation lands. And there's also great tax benefits for uh, the landowners. So right now we've just secured, and I'll, I'll talk a bit about that, um, some more land. So our protected areas, we have 67 properties, 5,269 acres protected across the moraine. This helps with resiliency to climate change. It provides species at risk habitat, and it helps preserve our biodiversity and environmental heritage. So your kids will get to enjoy those nature areas that we're enjoying today, and their kids, and their kids, and so on. So that's, um, again, another pretty cool thing. Why do we do it? Well, nature nerd, it's great habitat for birds and I am a, a big birder <laughs> and I just love nature. Uh, it's healthy ecosystems, protection for species at risk. And as I mentioned, it's something, it's um, intact nature for the kids down the road in future generations. So here's a map of where we are and some of the properties that we have and how uh, far across we are. So the Oak Ridges Moraine does stretch 160 kilometers. 
Um, so it's a pretty big area and we do on and near the moraine because there's some areas to the north that don't have protection. So we'd like to be able to protect the natural heritage and cultural heritage as well uh, in those areas. And we also protect farmland because uh, that's super important. We need to eat. Uh, this is our newest protected property. It just closed about two weeks ago. It's very exciting for us. 195 acres in Northumberland. This we're working with the Kirtland Warbler um, Restoration Group uh, for Ontario, and it'll be restored to a pine oak savanna, which is a rare habitat that were lost. Um, they were uh, habitats that were traditionally maintained by fire. Uh, and then the colonial arrival meant, oh, fires are bad, and that was taken out. And also the um, the effort to basically get rid of the uh, Indigenous ways. And so we lost that very important land management tool. Uh, and with that, we lost habitat for a lot of species at risk. And if you look at, you know, what uh, species are special to that, a lot of them are at risk or endangered or threatened uh, in Ontario. And one of them is the Kirtland's warbler, which is the bird of fire. So uh, this is the initiative. It's North America's rarest songbird. It's still endangered in Canada, but efforts down in the States have, uh, they've, it's just been taken off the endangered list, which is pretty great. And we're finding that the birds that are, are, are fitted with trackers are wandering up into the Oak Ridges Marine area because that's traditionally where they would have had uh, the proper habitat that they need to breed in. They're, um, they're very, very picky in where they breed. And so now that the populations have been secured down in the States, we wanna have the habitat ready for them up here to help them, um, I guess, secure their, their populations up here anymore uh, as, as much. And it's also really cool. If you've never heard of Kirtland Warbler sing, it's a really neat thing. Um, they have a really great, uh, a great call that you, you won't forget. Um, our goal is to have 400 hectares of habitat restored. There's a lot of community stewardship. So if you're interested in volunteering or learning more, um, you can go to our website and look at the, um, we have a, a page dedicated to that. And also uh, there's a great tourism opportunity. So down in Michigan, it's, it's a massive tourism thing. All us awesome bird nerds uh, going on bird tourism. So uh, we're gonna bring that some of that up North. It's, be patient though, it might take a while. <laughs> so, um, you know, as I said, mentioned, we are a registered charity. If you want, you can become a member, you can donate, you can volunteer, and we have more upcoming webinars. So we do have one on the Kirtland's Warbler coming up next week. And then we have Pollinator Palooza, and that is with Lorraine Johnson. Um, and if you know anything about native plants in Ontario, you've probably heard of Lorraine Johnson. She's, she's um, quite the resource. Uh, we also have this webinar being recorded and we have other past webinars being recorded. And so we have a library of those as well. Um, I'm really hoping that we can do more of um, these types of webinars and, in, and be able to share this wonderful Indigenous knowledge. So now I'll turn it to our stars of the night who have um, broken records for registration, which is pretty amazing. So we have Joseph, Andres and Janaid from Crater's Garden. And uh, they're gonna introduce themselves. So I think they'll probably do better at it than me. They'll have probably have more fun with it based on the pre-webinar stuff. Um, so there's three of them and they are dedicated to regathering and the education of Anishinaabe bird names and significant indigenous bird knowledges. These knowledges that help us live the life the Great Lakes region has to offer. Uh, and I hope I'm not gonna do the pronunciation so bad on this, but it's Nino Bimaz de Westwin. I'm sorry. If I did that wrong, it's a good life. Um, I'm still learning. I'm not very good at other languages. I apologize. Uh, so all their contact information is there. Without further ado, I am going to turn it over to our fantastic guest stars for tonight and let them wow you with all the information they have. So uh, guys, take it over. Hey, here we go. Can uh, Joe, can you see? Oh, Andres disappeared. Hey, man, don't be nervous. We're here with you. Why are you running away? <laughs> it's okay, man. We got you covered. Okay. The Q&A is already going. Here we go. Okay, so we're hoping that there are uh, a lot of questions and uh, how Joe describes um, conversations, th th this physical movement. Yes. Um, and so we're gonna we're gonna 
cover a lot of ground tonight with you, and um, it is all to, in an effort to give you a taste of this vast, incredible source of knowledge uh, that is Anishinaabe Moin and the names that exist within the language. Um, so, who are we? Um, you probably already know this guy fairly well, this is Joseph Bidoanakot, uh, the founder of Creole. Oh, Andres has appeared again. Uh, the founder of Creator's Garden. Um, he is an Anishinaabek man from Wikwemkong, and he teaches about medicine, nutrition, and living the good life in the Great Lakes region in relation to plants. Uh, has been doing so for over 10 years with communities all across Ontario and beyond. And it turns out he's also obsessed with birds. And so his obsession with birds on a random trip uh, ended up ended him in Costa Rica, where he met this next fellow, Andres Jimenez Monje, who is a Costa Rican biologist who has been doing um, the same kinds of things that Joseph does here in terms of uh, having deep ecological knowledge of the systems around him just by being in them all the time. Uh, what Joe did in Ontario, Andres did in Costa Rica. And so he has a vast depth of knowledge um, uh, the the biologist of our crew, the fully trained biologist of our crew that we have to constantly convince about the most simple facts that should be undeniable, things that Joseph and I will see with our own eyes, he will deny, and hence we have to, to make our methodology for confirming names and behaviors of birds very rigorous in order to pass his biological tenure. Uh, Andres also worked with uh, Birds Canada for um, a few years and started the Toronto Bird Celebration and was also the co-host of the Warblers podcast, which if any of you were fans of it, uh, he was a fantastic co-host on it and spread a lot of wonderful knowledge to people. And he also happens to be my best friend. Um, and I'm also kind of obsessed with birds and insects. Uh, some people who uh, I appreciate very much saying uh, pollinator stuff in the chat. Thank you. Uh, yes, I do some things with bugs and native plants and I care about bees and bumblebees and sweat bees and uh, everything else that helps, uh, helps keep the world go around. And the three of us are kind of on this journey together, this, this metaphorical and very literal canoe of trying to collate and attempt to describe the vast depth of knowledge that exists in Anishinaabe Moin that we think everybody that lives in this area, that lives on Anishinaabe territory, North America and well beyond uh, should learn to appreciate and, and sort of apply in their own lives. So, Tonight, before you continue, our yeah. chat is wildly wanting to know who our furry friend was. And in the canoe, there was Rosie. Oh, sorry. Bob, yeah, my bad. Joe's companion. And then behind Joe is his other companion that is always around with us, which is his daughter, Ruth. Yes. And we were going to do an ecological assessment of a property that Janae invited us to. And we had to find a canoe to get there. And it was pretty fun because we kind of got lost in the river. So we had to canoe and get into current for quite a while in order to. This, this canoe is my canoe. And Joseph said that this canoe has had eight lives already. And this was the first time that this canoe had been put in the water. It and was it a got very taken scary canoe. with four humans and a dog. <laughs> and we made it. It was wonderful. Look at our half-baked life vests. We had but to have Kendra those. Kendra so on out. the chat says she's got that canoe as well. So, you know, it's a popular model. Joe says it's a moose canoe, apparently. Oh, uh, yeah. So yeah that's a moose hunting, hunting canoe. canoe, I guess. <laughs> there, are no, there are no seats. It, so they it were... was a dodgy canoe to me. <laughs> it was great. We made it and made it back. Sorry, I forgot to introduce Rosie and Ruth. My apologies. They are obviously an integral part of our team as well. Uh, without Ruth, we would not find so many of the things that we have found. Uh, the reptiles. She's especially the snakes and reptile. You know, she is she is closer to the ground. Eyes are locked downwards. We're usually looking up. So, you know, we have our bases covered. 
uh, Andres's daughters help us with that process as well. Um, so yeah, you know, generational ecological input is a very crucial aspect of the work we do as well. And so with that, uh, you're here uh, at an event called Bird Names and Anishinaabe Moin, and I'm uh, expecting that not all of the 433 people here uh, may necessarily know what Anishinaabe Moin means. Uh, and if you all do, I am slightly terrified of you because that's too much knowledge. And that ship I don't know has Joel, sailed. I'm me sweating. And Andres have to offer you. But and it, in Anishinaabe Moin, you can typically break up words and try to understand their meaning by the context of each of those individual components. So if we do that with Anishinaabe Moen, we'll take the Anishinaabe and we'll split the Moen. Okay, we'll take just those two big chunks. Anishinaabe, who, what is that? Who are they? They are the people. You have heard of them in the land acknowledgments already. And so the Anishinaabe part, you're like, great, that is the Anishinaabe, the Anishinaabe people. Check mark. You're done. Great job. Now we move on to Moen. And, you know, it, a, a very uh, easy translation is uh, language. But if you were to look up, you know, this root in Ojibwe language or Anishinaabe Moen dictionaries, um, it's again useful to know how it is used in other forms in order to really understand what it's saying. And so if you look, if you look this, this route up, you'll find uh, one of the words, the Bajamoen. The Bajamoen is storytelling. You're like, stories. Okay, cool. Stories involve your voice. There's talking there. So, okay, cool. This is like a talking thing. Moen, maybe talking. And then you find another word, Nagamoen. Oh, that's to sing. Okay, okay, great. Another voice use. So, again, you're maybe getting the context that, all right, Anishinaabe and like, use of voice language thing is what maybe what Anishinaabe Moen is uh, fully meaning. And then you continue to look for that same root and find the word uh, Gawen the Moen, which is the word for jealousy. And you go, oh, okay. So if Moen is the sort of like voicing part, what does Gawen mean? And sort of do a little more searching around and you find Gawen is like something negative, something bad, something sad. And so is like something sad spoken aloud jealousy? Is that what jealousy is in its like pure form? I don't know, that's a whole psychological conversation. And then you keep scrolling further down and you find the word bizan in the moen, which is the word for contentment. And you go, hold on, that's the complete opposite of jealousy. How, what, what does moen mean? What and who is moen? And so ultimately, what this tells us is that every single sound in Anishinaabe Moen has a meaning, and that meaning changes based on where that sound occurs in a word. And so for our intents and purposes, I will tell you that Anishinaabe Moen is, is Anishinaabe people's language, and that it is all completely contextual. And hopefully you will get a better understanding of this concept by the time we are done with our birds. And speaking of which, we get into our very first one. Now that you have a complete and full understanding of Moen, I introduce you to Mawinans. If you change that single O to an A, now you've ended up with a different word altogether and describing a different species and a different creature altogether. So the NS in here tells you that there is a diminutive involved. And Joe, what does the rest of the word tell us? Wait, what? I was watching the chat. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> the chat is oh, bumping right now. It's I don't incredible. know. I can't. Oh, good. No, look away. Um, they want to know why the eyes are censored, Joe. So maybe we should start there. Why do we have censored eyes for no. now? Okay, so number one, uh, Junaid is just the greatest. Um, I really uh, appreciate having this guy around. His obsession with my language is it, it, amazing. Unbelievably amazing. I, I can not even, it's amazing. So 
Uh, yeah, Molinas, that's the, um, uh, there's a little owl in there. So real quick, uh, I promised I was going to focus on birds whom I, I really, really love. Um, and not so much plants, but uh, there we cannot because everyone wants to know why these are censored. And then you see in the chat, it's from ResDogs. Why was it even censored inside of ResDogs? Uh, ResDogs, if anybody doesn't know, is a, a, an amazing uh, series that I think is on Disney Plus now. Yeah, man. Um, uh, so this is actually really fun because if you're uh, learning about birds, um, or if you're going out and picking medicine, or if you're ever in the forest with a Anishinaabe person or First Nation Indigenous person, the chances are, if you see an owl, everybody runs away. Uh, you're not allowed to look at owls in our understanding of the way that this part of the world works. Um, and the reason why is because if you ever bother an owl, if, you're, if you ever impede on an owl's function in the environment um everyone's going to die that's the rule uh and this was the, this is consistent absolutely everywhere i go into the states into the far north you don't bother owls you don't look at owls and even if you have like a magazine or a calendar or something that is coming into your home you have to go through this these uh materials to take out all of the owls and not not allow them into the house there you don't look at them you don't bother them and we adhere to this tradition so much that you don't even have pictures of them in your home you do not have little figurines you don't you don't bother with owls because everyone will die and it's a really fascinating idea. I always wanted to know because I learn, I, I learn and teach about medicine primarily through Creator's Garden. And um, when I was learning, I would take knowledge holders out in the forest all the time to go and find medicine, pick medicine, to go and learn all of the different protocols uh, of picking medicine. And I would take people on these expeditions of flat tires, of very expensive car parts breaking gas was a dollar 60 a liter and they would see an owl and the day is over no more picking medicine we have to leave are you kidding this you know how much i spent to get us out here i don't have this money and so where does this idea come from it's amazing and actually andres was the one who really brought this into uh, full perspective for me at uh, what is it Yorkdale Mall we met years ago amazing so here's here's the deal deal with owls uh, Nishnawa people living in this part of the world you know there's no hospitals there's no ambulance there's no doctors we use plants plants are our medicine uh, and they're uh, valid uh, uh, incredibly valid forms of therapy uh, and so that's my job to teach about medicine and when you're uh, relying on medicine for all sickness and injury, this is a very important knowledge that you need to be able to live in this part of the world. If you get sick or injured, you need to know your uh, your plants that are going to help you. And so um, plants uh, and plant diversity in a forest is a part of a really, f uh, I don't want to say fragile, but uh, perfect system where uh, diversity generally relies, this is the greatest chat in the world. Um, uh, and so most uh, significant species of uh, medicinal plants rely on a process uh, um, of distribution or distribution strategy called Myra McCookery. I don't know if I'm saying that right, Janaid. How do you say it again? Now I'm reading the chat. I don't know. You guys kept talking about it. How do you say you that say? with ants? Myra McCulkery? Mar Mir Mikery, yeah. Mir Mikery. See, it sounds way cooler when this guy says it. So Mir Mikery. Mir Mikery. Mir Mikery. Uh, so the, basically what this means is that um, birds do not grab seeds from medicinal plants and then poop them out somewhere and that's where it grows. This phenomenon only occurs in other parts of the world throughout Europe and throughout parts of Asia. The reality is, is in the north, uh, like in the Great Lakes region, 
birds are one of the biggest enemies of plants, of, of seeds. They digest them and they destroy them. So what happens is uh, our distributor of plant medicines are ants. Ants will collect the seed because the seeds have a food called an ileasome, a casing around that seed. And the ants will eat that, that casing that is nutritionally complete for them uh, and essentially prepare the seed for germination. And from there, bears, black bears will grab and eat larvae from anthills, but they end up eating all of those seeds from the medicinal plants as well. And so all of the seeds that ants are collecting, they store them in their home and bears bring those out and eat them all with the larvae, the nutritionally and calorically dense larvae. And so uh, the bear's digestive system is like this big. And so the seeds go through the bear unharmed. And wherever the bear poops, it's just a giant buffet table for mainly deer mice. Um, deer, deer mice uh, will see all of these seeds, all of this food, and the mouse will collect all of these. And they will create a network of, tra of trails underneath the leaf litter where they, they, they bury those seeds a centimeter to a centimeter and a half deep throughout the entire forest floor. And so they bury all of those medicinal plant seeds and all throughout the winter, they grab those seeds and they digest them and they destroy them. And so the reason why we're not allowed to bother owls, the reason why we're not able to look at owls, the reason why if you impede on an owl's responsibility in an ecosystem, everyone is going to die is because the owl is responsible for removing the mouse. When they remove the mouse, all of those seeds will germinate. They will not be mouse food. They will become our medicine. And so it's very important for diversity that we rely on for sickness and injury. And so when uh, Andres was the one uh, uh, years ago who told me in Yorkdale Mall, <laughs> when I met him for the first time after Costa Rica, who said, uh, that one family of barred owls can eat 30,000 mice in one year. And you compound that with the other species of owls. You compound that with the other protector of medicine, who is uh, um, snakes, uh, who also remove the mouse. Uh, this is a very important system that human beings are supposed to be helping and so if we are harassing owls, we're impeding on the, the natural plant diversity of this area that affects our ability to access medicine. It affects pollinators, food sources. It affects so many different things. And so this is why we have such an stringent rule. You cannot bother owls because everyone will die. No one will have medicine. What are you going to do then? Uh, you know, now we have the system that we, that we can rely on for uh, to a certain degree, right? Uh, and, and so we're a little bit insulated from this tradition and the importance of it. But this is why in the series, this is why owls carry such an intense uh, responsibility to an ecosystem and our opportunity to live a good life here. And this is why, uh, you know, th and this is a sincere gesture of respect to some of the knowledge, traditional knowledge holders and practitioners who are in the audience here is that, you know, uh, just like in the show that is on Disney Plus Reservation Dogs is uh, why it is censored. Uh, and, and so this is a very important uh, tradition that we thought that this is a very important thing uh, to share with an audience uh, this large and this focused on uh, birding. You know, we love birds and we love seeing owls, uh, but to be respectful in this responsibility, very important responsibility portion to um, um, allow them to do what they're supposed to do and to not impede on their responsibility in all of these different relationships. Uh, and then just a small gesture to all of the participants here to look at each of those uh, influencers in the cycle, ants, bears, mice, owls, and snakes, and our, our responsibility to um, help with each of those processes. Uh, um, uh, for our sake, but uh, for the sake of our environment and uh, 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 as well. 
Uh, so all, all of our first species uh, uh, to talk about owls, um, this is why they are censored. <laughs> so one of my main roles besides being a biologist is to try to keep these guys focused. This is what I normally do in our conversations. And so um, after listening to this amazing connection between bears, um, ants, medicine, and owls, I want to go back to the name, but before I go back to the name, I want to say how responsible this little guy here is because it is cannibalistic, meaning it eats other owls from the same species. It eats bats, shorebirds, jays, woodpeckers, grouse, swallows, flycatcher, waxwings, crayfish, earthworms, tadpoles, frogs, rats, squirrels, and rabbits. And so you're seeing one of the most vicious after researching the diet of a Eastern screech owl, I was shocked. It eats tadpoles. Do you know how hard it is to catch a tadpole? It's incredible. And so it's very important to understand that owls have this critical role, particularly because they're very attractive. We're not very responsible with owls. We really want to see them and we don't let them sleep. We constantly harass them. We're not ethical when we find them. But having said that, having said how responsible this dude is, I want us to go for a moment to someone in the chat was saying that they don't sound screechy at all, that they sound very melodic. And so Joe, I wanted to ask you, what does Mawinans mean? Uh, so moe is to, uh, to cry. Uh, this describing somebody who is crying more and uh more and us is uh, uh i guess like the little crier uh, that's a, that's how we describe this bird so if you decompose that call that i just played which i kind of hope you listen to it through my computer which is little old and might need a replacement um what you heard was a combination of two parts of the call of this owl the tremolo which is that variation, and then a whiny part at the end. The tremolo is used for families to keep in touch, and the whiny section is to fight for territories. And that call, little crier, right, Joe, mm -hmm. is what names our Mawinats. You didn't hear what you were playing, but oh, Joe, you didn't. Oh, it I'm looks sorry. like you're searching something on your phone. Is oh, I was, I was play? playing a song. Yes, I was playing the Mawinans. Ah, okay. So I, I apologize it. for that. I don't know if others did, but Joe, are you replaying it? Can you hear it? So if you guys... No, I, I think Zoom that. is filtering the sound as exterior sound, not our voices. Uh, so yeah, that's why it's not working. Yeah. Zoom has an incredible filter for, for environmental sound. Okay, this is the first bird. And I promise everybody, we had a meeting about this. We talked about sticking to just a few minutes of bird, but th this has just been the Eastern Screech Owl. And yes, if you listen to the calls of the Eastern Screech Owl, the name should make sense to you. Um, however, it's, uh, see, Joe's got, Joe's got more caveats. So you see the tremolo at first, and then ah! at the end, there's the whining, a bit like a horse. And so they usually do it in like all together. And that's what gives this name. And looking at the time, we need to start picking it up. So should we go to our next bird? Going to the next owl. Now we've answered why the eyes are censored, but we are now looking at the barred owl. Strix okay. I think I can pronounce this one. Go on. So. Everyone, I've been trying to learn how to pronounce the names of birds. Let it be said, I am not Anishinaabe. <laughs> I'm Costa Rican. I'm not indigenous, even though in Latin America, we tend to understand as all of us being Métis, all of us being Mestizos. Um, but I'm not indigenous. And my role, as Junaid said in this, is to um, help with the two I seeing. I try to be one of the eyes, and we try to be Joe's supporters and help him reach this goal. This is what we do. We try to support Joe in the work he's doing. 
And so in that process, I'm learning how to pronounce in Anishinaabe. And so please, Ninate, don't judge me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> judge him. Go, go, go. Perfect. You might have noted, what is the first thing that you might have noticed is that there is a very onomatopoeic nature of that sound. Go, go, go. There's a, there's a repeat. And when sounds are, or segments of terms are repeated in Nishnabe Moen, it's often, often emphasizing a behavior. It's often emphasizing that, you know, this, this creature is repeatedly doing an action. And this will, this will come back around um, in, in other names as well. But Joe, can you tell us about the bardo and this name particular? Well, you can just play the sound again, I guess. It's my favorite owl sound, my favorite owl sound. I don't think I know exactly who my favorite owl is yet, but yeah, there is uh, that onomatopoeia. Um, yeah, so we, we kind of have, uh, uh, um, yeah, kind of, kind of like a little methodology that we try to figure out with each bird for all of the different sounds of all of the different names to try to find out exactly which species we, we are talking about. And uh, this is something that I've suspected for a very long time is that uh, a gokoko is how we can describe so many different owls. Um, but each owl has its own specific name that is describing a very unique behavior, uh, physical characteristic uh, pattern that it accomplishes. Um, and that is what we choose to emulate that species, just like the singing, the crying song of the Eastern Squeech Owl. Um, that's how we describe this one. Um, but uh, I, I think uh, a gokoko, if, uh, if it's not describing the whole family of owls, it's describing this one specifically, because you could just kind of hear just the way that it sounds. Gokoko, go, go, uh, go, 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 go. <laughs> my grandma does it real good. <laughs> like exactly. Yeah, so you could just kind of hear it right in the name. Uh, but yeah, I really like this one. And I learned from you, Andres, that barred owls are have a very unique behavior of like, hunting very actively on the ground. Um, can you talk a little bit about the habitat that they prefer? Um, they really like woody areas close to water. And in many cases, barred owls have been seen waiting. Can you imagine an owl just walking in the water to catch some fish? And barred owls are less vicious than some of their close relatives. Um, less vicious than the great horn owls and the eastern screech owl. It has smaller talons than the grain horn. And so it has a more limited type of prey that it goes to, but it can be very active on the ground. Um, but I want to touch, I want to go back, circle back to the process that Joe was talking about. One of the challenging things of what we've been doing is that in many cases, Joe goes into a community and he finds a name, but that name might have been disconnected from a bird. And in some cases, people know a bird and they don't know their name. And so what we've been trying to do is working back on the names and on the bird knowledge to understand who does the name belong to. You might remember that Joe said, this name, Go, 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 could be the name of the family, the name of the group of owls, or very specifically, the name for this owl. And it's because in that process, we need to try to dissect the name so we find who it belongs to, right, Joe? Yeah, what each of those sounds are describing is uh, specific to each species, yeah. And so, you know, on that note of trying to find those accurate names, we come to what would seem very reasonable, but really in practice d doesn't quite pan out. So this is the name Wabgokokok. And so the wab part is part of the word wabshkike, which is white, to be white. And the gokoko, you've already been familiarized with. So this is kind of saying like, this is a white barred owl. And when I said this name to Joe, um, because so much of my understanding of Anishinaabe Moin is from dictionaries and trying to find resources online, 
he he immediately went, yeah, but I never hear that in community. And so, Joe, tell me yeah. the struggle you have with this name. Uh, yeah, so um, this is really fun for, you know, uh, like especially for the uh, indigenous people in this audience or people who are really wanting to learn the language. You run into this a lot. And, and I have so much experience with this with plants. Uh, kind of transliterations or the way that some research was done because what what happens uh, in research in indigenous communities for so long has been so extractive uh, is that you find lots of error you find lots of uh, uh, um, research that is done uh, in, yeah just maybe not in the best practice so with this one it, it I've never heard anybody in any community uh um so yeah i go and i teach about medicine in hundreds of communities and hundreds of institutions all over ontario all over the great lakes region and as a as a as payment to me i ask the community to find uh, people who have bird knowledge because this is honestly what i've been obsessed with for a very long time I I, uh, I like telling everybody, I've, you know, I never really liked plants. This was kind of just given to me and I am responsible for this. And, and, and I've been doing the best I could with what I was given for plant medicine knowledge. And so when I go and teach, I want to learn about birds because this is what I really am obsessed with. And so um, when, when I go to work in a community to teach about plants, find your bird knowledge holders and try to bring them out to the event so that during lunchtime and breaks uh, I, I could pick their brain and try to find any kind of knowledge that i can about bird names and uh yeah i've yet a community to go to where there has been a bird knowledge holder who confidently said wap -ko -ko -ko. that's a that's a snowy owl <laughs> most of them honestly say i do not know and most of them gestured to Gokoko -ko -ko being uh, the name of the family of owls. That's all of our owls are Gokoko. -ko -ko. You know, they they all embody all of the uh, sounds uh, um, that that name is responsible for. And uh, just to say Wap -ko 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 is is a little bit of an easy out. Uh, and it's our job to do the research uh, required to be able to find what... Uh, uh, probably the snowy owl's real name is yeah. So we have our work cut out for us. Um, yeah, that was a really good point. I really wanted to make sure that we cover tonight. Okay, moving on to our next owl, and this is the first example of uh, the the name including uh, body parts. So uh, on this, want to try this one again? No, I'm going to leave this one to Joe. <laughs> ah, yeah, Togo no. go, go, go. There you go. Yeah, Togo go, go, go. And, and so, yeah, I mean, just as just as easy as, as it can be sometimes for me to dismiss Wab go, 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 uh, we do hear this name quite often in communities that I go to, Togo go, 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 that uh, Tog is, uh, is your ears. Uh, uh, and so Togo go, 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 go is... Uh, um um our long-eared owl um and w soon i mean you you might wonder why oh well how do you differentiate between a long-eared owl and a great horned owl they both have big long ears and so how do you differentiate between these species and so uh i think uh we made this one this pretty clear is this our next slide Be <laughs> <laughs> How are we going to tell these people what is going on here? I really, so, I really tried to convince them to, you know, leave this slide for like later, but you know, they really wanted to go with it. And I think Joe you know, told me what to do. Listen, okay. you saw the canoe, right? I'm the guy in the back. I just, I do, Yo, I do the logistics. The censoring, Junaid. That's all. What? <laughs> the censoring. Censoring of what? The oh eyes. no, we broke the Oh, I broke the rule. Look at that. Dang. This is the Sorry, last friends. everyone do not look. Don't look. <laughs> look away. Anyway. Yeah, get that, so that other bird. 
So what I did was uh, I one of the owls that I hear um, that is very, very common in anywhere from southern communities right up into the far north. <laughs> Goodbye, everyone. <laughs> this chat is amazing. Uh, so a, a name for uh, an owl, a species of owl that I hear all the time is Wien de Coco. Go um, and Wien de Coco is really interesting because um, uh, nice knowing you. Yeah, we we the goal is so, now, right? is a uh, there you go. Uh, awesome. You can look now. You open your eyes. Um, yeah, death metal owl. Uh, so we the go 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 is uh, describing we the go is a very important story in our culture. We the go is um, uh, describing something pretty awful. We usually use this word to describe uh, cannibalistic behaviors or uh, um, um, really uh, tyrannical, uh, just uh, egoic, uh, I don't know how to say, just, uh, just some of the most horrible aspects uh, that, are, that are just kind of Green. gross to imagine yeah and so we the go 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 is like man there must be one owl in particular that is so awful that separates itself from all of the other species of owl that the pure it, savagery it is just savage and both of these guys say well you know their uh, biologic biology knowledge they said, oh, well, there is only one. Because in my head, I was like, is that a great gray owl? Because some people say it's very big. It's very vicious. Maybe it's a great gray. Well, a great gray is pretty, you know, specific to its job. It keeps to itself. There's one in particular, the great horned owl, they say, is, is just like, uh, it, it just eats everything. It attacks everybody. And... Uh, um even um toy horses it tries to take home even toy horses it's important to know that even though great gray owls are the tallest owl in ontario mm -hmm. they are actually lighter than snowy owls and the great horn owls and great gray owls actually mostly eat small mammals uh whilst great horn owls I would say that any birder would agree that are the most vicious owl there is. And I started searching for their, their diet and it even include porcupines. Would you imagine to be an owl? Have you seen a Canadian porcupine? They're, they're huge. And to be able to take on a porcupine with, with the quills from above. And so they, you can find videos of great horn owls eating so many things from domestic cats to hunting bald eagles to catching um porcupines so yeah when to go 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 when to go 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 yeah this uh it's a it's an amazing name um and then yeah just to find images like this like attacking horses this is uh very aggressive behavior and i think that they are the ones who truly deserve this name that separates them from all of the other species of owls their talons have an eight, a strength of 28 pounds to sever the spine of their prey when they hit them. I just want everybody to know no horses were, ma were maimed we're, we're in the making of this photo. Uh, <laughs> that is a fake horse. This um, owl just wanted to prove that it can eat a horse. Uh, didn't get a real one. Okay, let's go. Let's go. Well, get, one get more thing out. about that owl, it eats other owls as well. So, Wendigo, for sure. Wendigo, for sure. Okay, now this might be a bird sound that um, you can recognize in the English name of the bird as well. Uh, most people who know their chickadees, their backyard birds, their winter critters, their fall visitors, um, will often have their own sounds of mimicry for the chickadee. You'll probably go chickadee dee dee. You know, you say it in their name. And this uh, same bird in Anishinaabemowin. Oh, there you go. Is Jigga Jigga And 
this name, now we're getting into the like multi-layered meanings that exist within each of these names. So though this name has an onomatopoeia in there, you can kind of hear the like chicka chicka in there. The act that it's describing is also very emblematic of the bird itself. So Joe, tell us what jig is talking about in the name. Uh, yeah, Tiga Tiga uh, This one is really fun. Um, so this is a perfect uh, name to for oh Nishaba uh, when it tends to be onomatopoeia, onomatopoeia. Get the they they create sounds. They just copy what the bird is saying, and then that's it. But this is a really good example of uh, no 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 no. Uh, there is onomatopoeia there as well. Obviously, Tiga Tiga You could hear it, but. Um, um, I always grew up, my parents always called me a little pyro, little fire bug. We have a little campfire. I never, I would, I wouldn't leave, I'd burn everything. I would be responsible to jiggy 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 to, to, it, it's like if you have a fire and uh, you want to make sure that it burns perfect, you want to make sure that it burns evenly. So jiggy 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 is to take those logs and to use a stick and flip them over to, to hide the unburnt portions and put them on top of the coals so that the fire burns evenly. And so it's uh, describing the, um, the, the act of hiding everything. Uh, so to, to take things and bury them or to stuff all of the little cracks and crevices with more wood so your fire is beautiful. Um, and so this is obviously describing the behavior of chickadees who are very well known for their ability to just, they take all of the seeds from generally backyard feeders and they go and hide them in all of the cracks and crevices all around your backyard and all of the little furrows and frayed pieces of bark. There are seeds everywhere in the cracks inside of your porch. They're stuffing, uh, 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 filling all of those cracks uh, with all of their seeds so that they can have uh, some food for later. Uh, but you guys were telling me like way more. It's not just like, oh, food for later. You know, they'll probably forget about it. This is a very unique, uh, lots of birds will hide seeds for later, but chickadees tend to have this very unique ability to uh, store massive amounts of food to cover them for very long periods of time. According to some researchers, their brain changes every fall. They actually clean neurons. They eliminate neurons that have old information and they grow new neurons to store new information because they can store 80,000 pieces of seeds on a season. And they need to know where they are. They need to know the quality of them so get the best ones first. And they also need to know which ones they've actually gathered. And so... According to other researchers, the chickadees that live where winters are harsher have a more developed hippocampus. Yeah. Yes, okay. thank you for coming back. Everybody hop back on. It was wonderful. Oh, it was like okay. 300 people. Okay. Everyone wants to know what's happening with the chickadee hippocampus. So yes. some research suggests that chickadees that live in harsher winter conditions have a more developed hippocampus than those that don't. And hippocampus needs or has to do with spatial memory. And so they, living in harsher winter conditions, have to store a lot more food and hence need to remember where it can be found. So chickadees are awesome. 80,000, every time you see, and, and also they're the most hungry eater. These guys eat the equivalent of 30 pizzas, 30 large pizzas a day. Imagine how much food it needs to store. <laughs> so as we're talking about this like seed hider, this, this, critter that goes around in your backyard, this bird that comes and hides everywhere. I know that there are people who are, you know, bird fans probably have another bird in their mind. And they're like, what? why is this name not for them? And that's because they have their own name. Bipegoyan or Bipegoyan. That is the white-breasted nuthatch. And if you remember way back to the very first slide, when we talked about Mawinant, does anybody you just throw it into the chat does anybody remember what the ns implied in the in the name of the animal someone says i don't oh, small small, small. Why you yeah. Yeah. They diminutive. small they're paying a lot of attention there you go so this is yes. an amazing group so wow. if i then told you that there was another bird called bipegawans 
who would you think it is? Write it in the chat. Pepe Gawain being the big one. White breast. Ah! Look at that. We got red breasted nut hatch, red breasted uh, woodpecker. That that that's a that's a seminar unto itself. All the woodpeckers have phenomenal, unique names unto themselves. But you are absolutely right. Bippe Gawens is the little uh, animal that does the behavior that Bippe Gawens is talking about. Which and Bip is go ahead. No, Joe, tell us what Bippe Gawens is. Oh, Bippe Gawens. Yeah. So. Uh, um... I like, yeah, so BP, um, you hear this name all of the time, or you hear these sounds all of the time, like uh, BP Sede are your lungs. Uh, and it talks about this very important process of the separation of gases. Um, and then there is uh, BP Gomokki, that's a type of frog who who's, uh, has a bunch of uh, warts on his back, like a, a toad. And so um, you have all of these separations of skin on its back. And, uh, it, and so BP Gouin is describing um, uh, the, one of their unique characteristics, even though they hide seeds just like the chickadee, that's not unique to them. What is unique to the nuthatch is when they are going up and down the tree, uh, they're flicking off pieces of bark. Uh, they're separating flakes of bark to get at the uh, all of their different foods uh, all up and down the tree, and so if you're ever underneath the tree while uh, Bip Gwen is, is foraging, a bunch of little stuff is always falling on you. Whereas if you're underneath a chickadee or a warbler, like they just go and grab what they need, and absolutely nothing happens. So a very unique characteristic of a nut hatch is the separations of pieces of bark that uh, that they're all, they're very responsible for. Interestingly enough, I think this is where the English name kind of meets the Anishinaabe Moin name because nut hatches are named nut hatches. And interestingly, Bipiwa, it also corresponds taxonomically to these two birds which belong to the same genus. Um, nut hatches grab a nut and then they jam it on a crevice and then they slam it with the bill. Look at that bill. It has this sledgehammer shape and it slams it and then it hatches it open. And so that's also a separation that they do. This is how they eat. And that's why they're called nut hatches because they hatch the nuts using that bill. And in the case of BPYA, um, it separates. And you see them going down the bark, separating the bark as well. Mm -hmm. And so this separation as Joe said, you know, BP, you hear this sound very often in Nishinaabe Moen, and it's true for birds as well. And so oh. now we have Bipi Goe. Yeah, Bipi Goe. This is a very different kind of separation. This is not as sweet and, uh, you know, adorable as a nuthatch just slamming a nut into, into a crevice and then opening it with its beak. This is talking about the way that this animal hunts, this very specific behavior of uh, spine breaking once an animal has been caught in midair. So the very quick nature of kill and spine severance is where this name sort of uh, comes from. Joe, what yeah. do you understand uh, but they to mean compared to uh, our previous example. Yeah, so BP Gouin, we know what this is describing a separation of something. And in the case of a nut hatch, it's all of the pieces of bark and the nuts like Andres described. Uh, BP Gouin, when you add that sound at the end of the word, BP Gouin, that means that there is a culmination of something. Something has ended in, in, in the sequence or, or, or of the separation. Um, something has uh, stopped its normal pattern. And so uh, what this is describing is a kestrel uh, uh, being very well known for uh, the separation of their prey's spine at the base of their 
skull and their neck as soon as the usually maybe even in flight they separate the neck of their prey um, um, to kill their prey very quickly um, which is really interesting because if you ever have opportunities to be able to spend time observing uh, kestrels um, I feel like it requires a very sophisticated and careful observation of the species to see exactly what they're doing, even with binoculars. And so to have this uh, uh, very um, responsible and careful observation of the species to be able to um, have this name being their reference, there had to have been uh, an incredible ability for Anishinaabe people to be able to observe this unique behavior of this species. And that is incredible to know. And I think that's why this makes this process of recovering names even more important. Because natural history, it's a dying science. It doesn't get the support it used to get. It doesn't get the enthusiasm it used to get. And it's one of the most important parts of biology. One of the things we love about grabbing a bird book is the, the natural history that it's in it. And every Anishinaabe name, or many of them, codify a lot of natural history that requires incredibly sophisticated observation. But if you spend so much time outside as they used to do, would you imagine all the things that you could have learned about the nature around you? Isn't that amazing? And so, we go from a tiny separator to another hawk that most of us are probably very familiar with. What a beautiful photo of that tail. It's incredible. Magnificent photograph. <laughs> I'm so glad we used I'm this I'm sorry, one. I didn't see that coming. Okay, so for, <laughs> I'm not laughing because I'm insane. I took this photo and Andres roasted me for it. Uh, he's like, that's a terrible photo. And I was like, no, it describes the name perfectly. And he was like, no, it's a it's a very bad shot. And I, he's like, the, the face is obscured behind the branch. And that is Andres's role. He is there to make us critically better. Um, but I stood by this because the name, Misquanonisi for red tail hawk. You have to let me say this on. one. I can pronounce it. Okay, go. Mesquananisi. We went to Point Pili last year. It was a seven hour drive uh, <laughs> one way. We got caught in uh, that windstorm, the giant windstorm that hit Southern Ontario last year. And Andres is a very restless human being. You know, he can't sit very still for very restless. long. And so he needed something to do the entire trip we were there. And I swear to God, the majority of it was him sitting in the back and you would just randomly hear, Musqua non is C, non is C, C non is C. With this Musqua introduction, non is C. With this introduction, so flattering, Joe, tell us what can you say about Musqua non is C? Oh man, these guys just abs and hernias, man. Um, <laughs> uh Miskwanan is he so um squa is the uh Mskwanan is the color red and so uh non is he is really fun because in the, a lot of the uh a lot of the bird names uh and especially the ones that are describing the um just unique physical characteristics um you see um uh bird anatomy and uh it's actually really fun a bird, uh, like uh, a tail is uh, most people will say zoano like uh, um like a uh, um shukashukandue zoano that's a flying squirrel's tail um and so uh, but then and so you would think well how do you describe a bird's tail and we say non the sea and it's like oh what, what does this mean it was my mom who who told me uh my mom is uh, um an amazing language teacher uh who was raised fluent and so amazing resource for me to have uh and she describes oh non is he you know it's it's describing uh the like a rudder on a boat uh, like uh, you use this to change the direction that something is traveling in and so you know it's very different than like uh 
a, a, a flying squirrel's tail or a, a lizard tail or a squirrel's tail or any any a horse's tail. These are uh, very specifically describing a bird's tail, very unique in changing their ability to change direction. And so Mesquana on the scene is describing the red tail uh, of the red tail hawk. Uh, but mo most importantly, I guess the tail's responsibility to be able to cause the bird to be able to change direction. Um, but yeah. <laughs> so as we go through these names, you know, um, you can also start to maybe hopefully see that if you were to organize, if you were to try to create species groups in Anishinaabek understanding, you might end up with a very different correlation between bird groups than how Western science codifies, you know, genealogically similar species. You would probably end up organizing uh, species by their ecological function and how they interact with the environment around them and with other species within that environment. And that is a very different style of taxonomy than if you were to do it the way that we do, which is basic, or, you know, that Western science does, which is basically on like physical morphological similarities, and then, you know, over time, genetic similarities and speciation. And so based on this, if you were to, you know, try to find other examples of Musqua in names, you find Musqua Nage, and this is another example of that color and body part combination. Andres, that... wait, wait, Andres is so upset. You did not give him this opportunity. You know how many times I've heard him say this name? This one? I didn't know that. I'm sorry. Over oh, it's Nage. And over and over. Awkward. Sorry. My bad. I'm sorry. I cut you really Andres, off. Andres, for sure, next one, all you. Oh, this is okay. going to be good. <laughs> 100%. The next one, I'm not going to know how to pronounce it. Next <laughs> one is all you, my man. Okay. I will leave the floor wide open. Super easy. No problem. Cliff swallow. Easy. You're giving me the hardest one. You Tell us bro. about Miss Kwanage, Joe. <laughs> oh, this one, I'm sorry. It's just like the red tail hawk. Uh, Miss Kwanage is just uh, describing the red shoulder. Um, th this one's really fun because one of the things that we really like to tease out when we're digging into understanding what name belongs to a particular species, um, most communities that I go to, any any robin-sized black bird is going to be um, e either they'll say Jachakano um, or they will say Signak. Um, yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah, Jachakano or Signak. That's and this is kind of like all black birds. And um, it's our job to figure out exactly which species is being described. And so one of the things that we figured out with blackbirds is that Jachakano uh, uh, is describing the family of blackbirds. Um, and each blackbird is going to have a very specific name. Um, um, Signok is our uh, common grackles who tend to fly in tighter groups. Um, now we have... Um, uh, who is their name? The European Starlings. starling. Yeah, European mm -hmm. starling, um, who is not from here, but, you know, they kind of fly in these really tight groupings. Uh, so, you know, they could share the same name. Uh, but Miss uh, um is uh, the red-winged blackbird, just describing the red shoulder that it has. Jachakono um, is uh, the... Jacham uh, uh, is the sneeze. <laughs> and so Dotokono are the sneezers. It's a family of birds that are the sneezers. And Junaid Junaid does, will exemplify. Junaid does the perfect <clears throat> sneezer. <clears throat> <laughs> if any new birders here would have seen um Grackles and blackbirds and things like that, they tend to make this sound that Junaid has just so it again. exemplified. There you go. Do it again. Do it, Do it again, Junaid. <laughs> yeah. And then. <laughs> that was perfect. <laughs> That's such a grackle. 
Bravo yeah. today. Bravo yeah. today. This is why we invited you to this to amazing this webinar. This yeah. was your moment of glory. You Thank lived you. up to it. And <laughs> you're very proud. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's a very fun practice. I, I mean, you hear uh, for we did this for the family of woodpeckers. We are doing this for the families of shorebirds. And this is uh, um, a really uh, uh, important practice to uh, kind of not just accept the, the name uh, and to I, I think well, the way that I've been doing it, obviously, this is not the same practice that can apply to everybody. But you, you, I think that when we're hearing the Nishnabe names of birds, um, that there, it, it may be harmful to have just an immediate acceptance. Um, and I think that each of these names deserves to be uh, uh, challenged. It deserves to be put through a process where um, these names are challenged and in that challenge you're able to uncover some of the most fascinating uh connections like uh, this this chat is just wild talking about uh, ah this is really fun yeah so um so this for, is our job for the new birders out there the things the red things on the shoulder of this bird it's only part of the male colors females are brown and they need to hide in the nest um, these are called epaulets. The red things on the shoulder are called epaulets, and they are a display of males protecting territory. Males are incredibly defensive, and people living in Toronto and in cities might have realized that Mesquanage is back and it's hitting people in the head. Uh, they actually spend 25% of, the, of their daylight defending territory because they can have up to 17 or 20 females per male. And so defending 70 to 20 females, it's quite a task. And so the funny thing is that these guys arrive to territories, wintering territories. They're some of the first to arrive. The snow is here. There's no food. And these friends are here. And so be really responsible to them. Leave food out. Take good care of them. Don't scare them too much. They're tired. They've gone through a long migration. But in the morning, they're defensive. And in the afternoon, they go to feeding territories and become more social with other males. And so they go for a drink with the friends in the pub, you know? That's what Mesquanage does during the day, especially at this time of year. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's okay. go. Here we go. You're ready. Andres, you ready? You're primed. Simple. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to murder this name. I have too much respect for Anishinaabe Moen. I have to murder this name. This could not have happened any better. Now, this uh, photo was taken by Andres, and it describes this bird and its name in its entirety. Joe, would you pronounce the name, please? Yeah, ah, Andres. You, you don't even dare, Junaid. You uh, see? Andres? You're giving oh, it to sure. Joe. I... Andres, repeat after me. Okay. Memsa. Memsa. Takonik. Takonik. Week one. Week one. Memsa, oh. Takonik, week one. Oh my God. <laughs> Amazing. This Costa Rican is the greatest. Yeah, this one, I love this one. Uh, actually, I, I, I had to ask my mom recently. Um, I was wondering, uh, be, because the way that I described it to Andres and Junaid is that the, um, the middle part of this name is Takonik. And I used to always hear my dad when he would uh, he, he would grab my daughter, he would come home or come to our home when my daughter was first born. And this is a word he just repeated over and over and over again, you know, do you want this? Tukunik, Tukunik. And, and, and so it's just like when we were going through bird names, I wonder what we could present to this group. Um, and then we got to this in the list and it's like, hey, we should put this in there just because it's like, it's so cute of a name because I thought Tukunik kind of means to cuddle uh, because that's how my dad would say this word when he would hold Ruth, my daughter. And so I said, it's the cuddle bird. And, and then you see, you know, the uh, cliff swallow, the, the, the nest that it has, it's like a very tight sleeping bag type of cuddle and, and and this is kind of like a very rudimentary understanding. And my mom corrected me and said, uh, it, it, no, it's not to cuddle. It is describing uh, to be carried. Um, 
so just to be held like a like a baby and then uh you know some of these images of cliff swallow you google them yeah like a like a cradle board picking all of them uh this chat is just the greatest thing in the world focus oh, i can't no, even focus ah! on the story yeah so uh yeah tuck is to carry and so you see the environment that it creates for the nest that it creates for itself is just the the perfect little so baby tuck. holding uh little little cuddle buggy kind of home that it makes um, and another thing about this is that this is another family, right? Like there are so many swallows that you could see around here. But again, this name is very unique in describing this particular species. Cave swallows make a different structural nest than bank swallows do. And it is this specific cliff swallow that makes a tiny little sleeping bag to fully be carried within you know, its own creation. And Andres, I promise this, this one, I am setting you up for absolute success. Wait, wait, but there's something really cute about this bird that our oh. friends need to know. Let's go. First of all, they're amazing engineers. The wall can be up to a centimeter thick. And when they carry stuff, because now that Joe said to carry stuff, it made me think, of all the mud that they carry. And so they bring mud pellets and then they put it on the walls and then they go super cute trying to just, you know, organize that mud and shape it. But one of the cutest thing, and I don't know how many birds have this ability, but they can recognize their young in a group of other swallows, in a group of 3000 swallows. And they can recognize this through their voice and through ultraviolet patterns of, of, in their faces. And through the colors in their faces, they can recognize their young in the group. And I find that mind blowing. Amazing. Okay, we set Andres up for the next. Negetze. Negetze. Yeah. Negetze. So this is where, you know, we're, we're now getting to have a little more fun with uh, names that have become so uh, common and culturally accepted uh, on, the, on the English side of things that we almost forget what they're implying in the, within them. And so the English name for this bird is bald eagle. Andres, can you describe to me what the scientific or the Latin name for the bird is? Yes, it's saying Aliaetus leucocephalus. The key part, Aliaetus at the beginning is the name that we use for many eagles. And leucocephalus means solely white head. White, leuco, cephalus, head. And so somehow the white head in Latin went from white headed eagle to bald eagle. And you have to be a very specific skin color to have a bald white head. And so this is a name that I argue fits another bird a hell of a lot better, and that is the turkey vulture. It is actually bald and looks like an eagle if you don't know your Vs from your straight plank flight far away. This bird does not deserve this word. It has a white head. You can see it. White-headed eagle makes so much more sense. With a but lot of feathers. The Nishnabe Moen name, Migize, makes even more sense when you understand uh, what the name is describing. Joe, what is Migiskan? Uh, yeah, Migiskan is a hook. Uh, it, it can be a knitting, knitting hook, it could be a fishing hook, it could be any kind of a hook that's uh, Migiskan. And so, what part of this bird is that term describing? those fishermen hooks absolutely the most terrifying feet i've ever seen and if you're ever close enough to see an eagle's yellow feet you're usually scared you're too close as well <laughs> <laughs> and those feet are so incredibly powerful and unique to these birds 
we often think that these birds are, they get a lot of credit for being like hunters or whatever. You'll see, you know, if you go on Google and you Google a photo of a bald eagle and you see that photo of a friggin' eagle landing and picking up a fish out of the water. Okay, listen, that happens maybe 3% of the time that a bald eagle survives. They not are real mostly, statistics. those are not real statistics. Those are not real statistics. Okay, I have not spent this much time with all of the bald eagles, but I am telling you that most of the time they are scavenging and actually stealing food from other birds. So the strength of those hooks on their talons is actually to be able to snatch away from another bird, a turn that has done all the hard work of getting that fish from the water and now gets bullied out of the sky. But this giant white-headed eagle that had done no work in the process but because it has these incredible claws and these incredible wings it is terrifying and so is very successful as a scavenger and thief exactly this next bird is where i get to talk about insects a little bit and uh i'm gonna try to i'm gonna try to keep it short uh i'm not gonna try the name this time Mm. But I think it's yeah, yeah what is the word for beetle joe in nishnabe uh well uh, that's a real cute name we are most beetles we call them uh um uh and uh in in like my very childlike understanding of nishnabe when um chichigam is a wart you have on your skin and so uh, is uh like the warts on the earth <laughs> and there's our beetles we we had a great conversation as joe mentioned earlier too you know we're teasing apart these shorebirds and shorebirds for anybody who has spent any time looking at them i have a shirt repping them i love shorebirds um you you get a very quick understanding of how confusing and cryptic they can be to tell apart from one another. And so trying to find the name that is most appropriate for a different shorebird led us to try to debate Jichishkwe. Uh, and in trying to understand the dietary or what connections this, you know, this name Jichishkwe could have with um, the beetles, um, we discovered that killdeer in, um, in the natural history research that has been done and used to be supported, um, animals collected in the field and uh, assessed for their, uh, their uh, gut content. contents to figure out exactly what they were eating, were found that over 40% of their diet was adult coleoptera. Coleoptera is the entire family of beetles. And 20%, a further 20% of their diet was larvae from Coleoptera. So essentially, they're just eating adult beetles and young beetles. And based on the sheer proportion of uh, beetle larvae that exist within killdeer um, uh, uh, guts, <laughs> this name is so absolutely fitting for this particular bird. Now, you might say that there are other shorebirds that also eat a similar kind of diet, similar uh, type of breadth of coleoptera. But what makes Chichishque so special for this name is layered in other teachings as well. Joe, can you tell us a little bit about the uh, other relationships that killdeer has with its name? In terms of like, so I don't want to I don't want to take us off a track too long, but there there is a very fascinating teaching around red-eyed birds and the the name of this bird that has oh. more things than than just uh, the simple implication of its connection to beetles. Oh yeah, yeah. So this is my uh, oh yeah. Okay, so this is uh, one of my favorite uh, kind of bird teachings. And, and technically, I guess I have not really gotten in all of the experiences that I've had with bird knowledge. I, I haven't really received much authentic bird teachings. Um, uh, 
and uh and yeah ho hopefully you know that can change but um yeah the um my favorite is uh red-eyed birds uh, red-eyed birds generally the you know the i the the story is is that they have red eyes from uh from grief or from mourning uh or or from uh, uh sad emotions that they've been crying so much that their eyes are are red and so we look at loons and you know they have this uh really haunting uh sorrowful call uh th that they're very well known for they have those deep red eyes and so they, this bird a part of their behavior and you know your responsibility to observe this behavior um is uh, is that you're going to get a teaching about uh about grief so if you learn from these red-eyed birds you understand them their behavior you spend time with them they will teach you how to grieve uh it was really fun i i was a part of this magazine uh, i forget what it was called it was some cottage magazine it sent me an email and was like hey let's talk about birds for some article somewhere uh <laughs> and uh we had this amazing conversation about this idea um, because if you're ever walking through the forest with uh, like uh, somebody who is known for, you know, their Nishnabayatsu and they have lots of uh, knowledge, um, when they are in the uh, forest and if you find the feather, uh, a lot of the times, you know, kids will find feathers and they'll take it to somebody like, look what I found. And, you know, your responsibility as, a, as an educator or a knowledge holder is to say, well, that's yours. You're the one who found it. And you're the one who has to learn who that belongs to and the teachings that that bird carries. And so uh, when you find a woodpecker feather, uh, you have to, it's your, it's a responsibility that you've been given. It's like uh, the universe's way of showing you that this is an important piece of your education. And so take this home as a memory of what you have to learn about for something in the future and so when you find uh hawk feathers when you find loon feathers uh, when you find the feathers of uh which i find all the time but black billed cuckoo feathers uh, um which have red eyes as well and so these birds that have red eyes contain uh knowledge as a part of their natural story uh um that when you understand it you 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 gain those uh those teachings and uh <clears throat> and you could learn from your environment how to live in this part of the world and so birds that have red eyes are very very unique in their ability to teach us about grief mourning and a certain amount of emotional intelligence with these more sad based emotions um and so when Somebody you see the pointed out in the chat that I know this, this bird has a process of uh, faking injury yeah. in order to draw predators away from where it's trying to protect its nest or its partner. It's exactly and so you'll notice that its eye is not fully red. It has an eye ring of red. And so, Joe, what is it doing? It's a fake. It is, it is pretending to be sad. It's faking sadness, which is amazing. Which is truly a beautiful thing. And I want to end on this bird, which was one of the most joyous moments of our naming methodology process. Uh, Joe talked about you know, growing up and being considered the pyro of his family and, you know, moving around that, uh, that fire all the time. So, Joe, tell us what the Mushkode in Mushkode Jichi Shkwe tells us and what it led us to discover. Uh, yeah, so um, this is a name that I hear all of the time. Uh, it's, it's really funny because uh, shorebirds are very, very difficult. When I'm working in an indigenous community, I don't get a lot of uh, bird knowledge holders out on a shoreline because generally reserves are just tucked away into swamps and into rocky woodlands and in, uh, into all of the inhospitable, horrible places to live. That's where they put all of us. That's where all the reserves are. They don't give us the waterfront properties. 
<laughs> and so not too often am I with a knowledge holder on the shore, looking at a shorebird, and they're able to say, oh, look at this one. This is Mish. Uh, no, you never have that experience. And so we have confirmation issues. And so, but I have the names, you know, lots of these people that, you know, they're like 80, 90 years old and we're out in the forest picking medicines and they'll say hey you know my dad told me a name once of, of a bird that he always used to see and his name is and do you know who that is and of course at the time you know i cannot really explain exactly but uh you know it sounds like a shore bird um and and so now it's our job to tease out i wonder what species Mesh kode jichi shkwen is talking about. And so it's obviously jichi shkwen. It's got this shorebird uh, uh, look and personality. It's a part of the same family. But what's that beginning portion is mesh kode. Uh, mesh kode um, is, a, is a fire. Um, it's like a shkode. It's like a, like a campfire that you have. And so it's just like just at the table with Junaid saying, you know, this mesh kode jichi shkwen is a shorebird that kind of Meshkode is sometimes the name that we use to describe a recovering prairie, like an area that's recovering from a forest fire. That's uh, Meshkode. And so maybe it's a shorebird that kind of likes these uh, previously burned areas and recovering prairies. Um, and Junaid immediately knew, oh, you know, this is, <laughs> there's only one shorebird, you know, that looks like a campfire. It looks like charcoal on the bottom and an ambery orange fire on the top. And it was a dunlin. And it, this is a perfect uh, if you're looking at these uh, yeah, sooty breasts, you guys are going wild in the chat. You know exactly what we're talking about. This is uh, this is the shore bird that looks like a little fire pit. <laughs> okay, and with that, I want to leave like 18 or 15 minutes for questions. And... I was aiming for 40 minutes for questions, but all right. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 definitely. We've got. But Junaid went and played a video or a picture of an owl with no, no sensor. You had eyes. to uncensor the owls of the owl, the eyes of the owl. Listen, guys, I really thought everybody forgot about collapse. that by now, and you had to bring it back up. Like... We are lucky to be alive. So, Joe, in the Q&A, there's several questions. One of them is, could you go over the pronunciation of Jika Jiganishi? Jika Jiganishi? Yeah. Um, in what way to go over the pronunciation of? Pronounce it real slow. Oh, um, Jika Jiganishi. So, a bunch of J's and G's and I's and Jika uh, Jika 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 is when you're playing with the fire, Jigga Jigane Shi is that little hider of everything. Jigga Jigane Shi. Then Michael Keys, I think, answered his own question. How do you say cardinal? <laughs> he answered his own question? Yeah, he says Miss Kobineshi. So the spelling is not quite there, but. He did answer his question. Now, how do you separate the, this from other red birds? <laughs> ah, wow. Now you have to. Separate it from a scarlet tanager. Uh, now oh, you have well, to that. introduce a proper methodology. You that is. Season, you come to episode two. Yeah, that's right. And then you <laughs> find out who a Shkode Buneshi is, and you're like, oh, okay, that's that's a different person. And hey. so it oh. makes sense that Musqua Buneshi is this other bird. So uh, what are blue jays called in the language, Joe? Oh, this one is fun. Um, so we hear two names. We hear um, Dean to see uh, and um, oh no, uh, Dean to see is one. That's the one that I sub suspect uh, more to be um, a blue jay. And so people will, will all, uh, always be talking about um, blue jays and Canada jays uh in the same sentence and so um yeah blue jays uh um how do we say oh yeah dean to see and um queen guish is the other one queen guish uh so we have to figure out which one is referring to blue jays behaviors and which one is 
referring to Canada Jay's behavior. So now we have to understand, well, what exactly is Queen Guish and what is that exactly is Dean de C. So we'll soon so find out. Matt Isles asks, where and how and when can we obtain the Birds Canada Anishinaabe Bird Name Leaflet Guide? I, the, the, the website there. On the garden market right now. CA. Uh, we, we thank, Joe's we're been we're flashing them around. Joe, show the thing. Yeah, we want to take a moment to appreciate and thank every single actor that participated on creating that Anishinaabe Bird Names. Birds Canada for their amazing support. The Wigwami Kong Nation for for supporting us with this. Environment and Climate Change Canada, who supported the creation of it as well. Um, Diana Theriol, who made the illustrations. Jody Allaire, who made the revisions. Am I missing someone, Joe? Nenatic for French reviewing the name. Who also reviewed. Nenatic, who has me sweating right now, who reviewed the names in Anishinaabe and the spelling. Thank you, Nenatic. I send you a big hug. Man, I saw the question in the Q&A. Uh, the question was a successful thief. Ironic. It's the national, the national bird, bird of, of USA. <laughs> the US of A. Amazing. Uh, oh, can I answer Cynthia's question? Can you say Northern Flicker in the language and say what it means? Andres, oh. all you. It's all you, man. And then, Joe, can you tell us what it means? Moningwene. No, you. No, no, no. You, no. I did my part, man. I said Muningwene. Uh, yeah, that one's fun. Looking at all of the different woodpeckers uh, and figuring out which name belongs to each species, describing very unique characteristics that each woodpecker has, Muningwene being uh, the digger. Uh, so describing uh, uh, Muningwene as yeah, the one who is always digging in the ground and not pecking at trees obviously very specific to a uh, northern flicker. So in the questions, Dina is concerned that she might not be re able to remember the pronunciation. And so she asks, is there's audio recordings for the pamphlet? Well, Dina, um, well, maybe Junaid, you can answer that. What did we do in the pamphlet so people could pronounce the names? So we've included in there the sort of the tonal, the sounds that you want to mimic um, as you're speaking them in English. Um, and, you know, it, it's very important to know that you're not, you're not gonna be judged on how you pronounce these names uh, because there is a vast differentiation in pronunciation across Anishinaabe territory as well. You know, if we were talking to people in Minnesota, they would probably have uh, issues with how uh, me and Joe have said words, and that's just because there's such a variation of, of language and interpretation and names. And this is another really important part of this process to understand is that across the you know traditional territories of the Anishinaabe people, you would see birds in different forms. So we've also had conversations around names where we've been uncertain as to whether that name applies to the same bird occurring further south. So for example, Chicago Beneshi, which is bobolink. Bobolinks appear when you see them in, in Ontario, if you get a chance to see them, they're a species at risk, very phenomenal grasslands, we gotta keep them around. Um, you'll see that they have a very striking color. They have this white stripe and this you know, yellowish head, black body. But in the fall, all of them look like fat brown birds. And down south in the US, they used to be known as butter birds because they were so easy to hunt in their large flocks of just boring drab brown birds. And you could hunt them and eat them very easily. That was part of the reason that their populations declined so heavily further north up here, because in the fall, they would look like a completely different species. And so because Anishinaabe Moin is so land-based, we have to recognize that the names can apply to the same species, but in different ways across Anishinaabe territory. Um, so yeah, those are, those are some things to consider, but all of that to say, um, you know, We've tried to make the pronunciation uh, guides as easy to follow as possible, uh, but there are also dictionaries and other things available online where you can hear the sounds. Um, ahead, we use the full vowel form. 
um, not the simplified version. And so that's very important for, for, for accuracy and for people, for the names to be more used or accessible in different territories. That's why we went with the full vowel form. Yeah, and also too, like for pronunciation and continued learning, uh, we are really looking to share as much of this knowledge as we can in the form of educational materials like this, uh, but also through all of our social media, uh, Instagram and Facebook and uh, uploading um, more formalized kind of programming on our Patreon. Rapid fire, Joe. A lot of questions in the chat, man. We need to yeah, yeah, yeah. on size. Okay, okay let's go. Okay. Uh, Many people are asking about events and in-person events. We have a roster of events coming in which the three of us are going to be there. They're not defined yet, but we're hoping to be with the Kawartha Land Trust at some point, and we're hoping to be in Pili um, at some point. Dates are to come. Keep an eye out on the website, and we're hoping to be able to do some in-person hikes. Aim for the common grackle, a Siganok. Done. Uh, Ani, how does one? Oh, um, this was a good question. Uh, is there a term that refers to flocks of birds? My immediate thought was benashiik, but is there a specific word that talks about just like a grouping of birds traveling together? Mm, I don't not know. Um, we just posted about uh, ducks the other day on our Instagram and Facebook pages where uh, I think that's gonna be different for each species. Uh, each grouping of each different species is gonna have a different pattern or behavior that we will emulate in, in the uh, naming of that process. Uh, so that is probably gonna be species specific, like for ducks, we call ducks G-sheep. And um, G-sheep is just describing the, the, the place that they occupy between the sun and the horizon. Um, and, and you kind of have to play with your imagination a little bit because the flocks of ducks that we see now are not what they used to be. Uh, they used to be thick uh, uh, um, clouds of, uh, of ducks and that's the space that they occupy between the sun and the horizon. Uh, 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 um, like uh, Zhi sheep is like describing the occupation of a space in between two things. So the sun and the horizon, but also between the land and the water. Uh, ducks obviously being able to go in between those two areas, occupying that space in between. Uh, so groups of birds are probably um, going to be different just based on the, the uh, species. You had okay. another question that I think is really interesting as well. Uh, when males and females of the same species look different, are there different names for each of those? Uh, individuals within that species. Sorry, I wasn't listening. I was reading other questions. <laughs> is there is there a different word when birds are sexually dimorphic? When one looks one way, males look one way, and females look the other. Cardinal Musquabaneshi, you know, that describes the the redness of the male. Does that apply to the female as equally, or does the name of the female change? Uh no, I think that's referring to the species. Um, I don't, I, I wouldn't expect there to be a difference. No, they, there's no difference in uh, with mammals, with bugs, with fish, with plants. We don't usually see that too much. There's two questions that I'm going to fuse in one. Someone asked if there's pamphlets available in Wiki, and then someone asked if they can connect to indigenous birder communities. We ran a fantastic project with Wiki Tourism. If you guys want to take a bird walk with indigenous bird knowledge, go to Wiki Tourism. They have some pamphlets there. And we were there running some training with the guides. And they are now starting to develop products regarding ethnological bird tourism in, in Wigwam Park. Is that right, Joe? Exactly right. Yeah. Go to Wiki Tourism. Joe, contentious one, Northern Sowet Owl, what's the name for it? We'll uh, see. And we're getting, we're getting called on it. The boss Here's is Island. coming in. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> we did pretty good. That's like 20 questions we answered. So you awesome. Just firing them off. I was worried I'd have to read them all. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we lost a few when we lost the webinar, but... Um... 
Oh, just a few. We got yeah, right just back a few. Up we were at like 390 right up until like yeah. 830. There. There's still over yeah. 300 people here. It's questions. Phenomenal. We lost a few questions. Yeah, we lost. Oh, questions. My bad. I thought people. <laughs> Sorry. My bad. We lost a few people yeah. too. So uh, I'm glad that you guys uh, allowed us to record it because I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people that uh, are, are really interested in this. Um, wow. That's all I said. Wow. You guys, this is amazing. Um, very just. I don't even know what to say. I'm speechless, and that's I talk a lot, so that says a lot there. Um, thank you so much for sharing this amazing knowledge and for um, the laughs and the um, the very entertaining. Evening. Thank you so much. So um, we're we we would really love to work with you guys again. Um, we'll be in touch, and hopefully, you guys will be open to something in the future. Uh, thank you to everybody who joined us. Um, from all over the place and i hope you guys learned something as well uh we'll, we'll wrap it up for now there was uh some questions about land trusts and land back um concepts um i didn't get to answer them specifically but please feel free to email me i'd love to uh provide more information i'm land trust at oakridgesmoraine.org where you can reply to any of the contact uh, emails that were sent out um with this email so I don't know. We're going to have to do a round of applause um, with Emoticon. Thank you, guys. That was amazing so much. And thanks, everybody. I hope everyone has a fantastic evening. And uh, get out there. The birds are coming. Some of them are back. And the um, best way to find birds is to get outside. I love all the emojis. I feel so. Yeah, look at that. That's amazing. I've never oh. seen so many emojis. Oh, that on First Nations here. That. Hi. We were, you remember, we were. I, I worked with y'all once. Oh, this is wild. Okay, thank it's you, everybody. Jimmy Wedge. Holy crap. Look at those, <laughs> look at those, look at those emojis. Thank you, people. We're thank really you, everybody. Connected. So kind of you. Wow. So, so kind. It's almost Yo, wallpaper. Is... That's impressive. <laughs> Man, that was so fun. Oh. I knew it. That was amazing. Well done, guys. That was, you guys have a lot of fun, don't you? Good try. try because this That's is not our day job you know oh, yeah. uh, we all have day jobs and then the, the, the obsession and the laughter has to carry yeah